Hello everyone, we're getting ready to look up today with a brand new Uplook video with an encouraging look at another top 10 list. You can like the video, subscribe, and ring the bell to make sure you don't miss out on any future videos. Today's topic, 10 tactics Jesus used to present the gospel in difficult situations. We've had it pretty easy in the West when it comes to opposition when we witness. Not so in the rest of the world. But Jesus knew what it was like witnessing to a hostile crowd. So he's our teacher on this subject too. Want to be effective? We'll need to master these tactics. Let's take a look at Jesus in action. An exciting top 10 as we look at how the Lord Jesus dealt with real people in real situations. Uh, number one, he offered his friendship to those of a different way. Yes, the Gospel of John as it opens in chapter 1 verses 39 and 46. Some of John's disciples come to see Jesus and uh, he invites them home with him. And I'll never forget being invited to a Hindu monastery where uh, my friend Anil was talking to an elderly Hindu gentleman and he shared with him the story and said, you know, when they said, where do you live? He said, come and see. Some people, if they don't know us, they'll tell us the town they live in, but they rarely invite us home. But the Lord Jesus did that. And he said, I take it from this that it's okay to learn from Jesus, even if you're the disciple of a different way. And I found this so often the case that if people come to engage with me and they perhaps want to argue about their religion, one of the best things you can do is say, hey, I'd like to be friends first. So let's go out for lunch or come to our home or can I help you with something? Usually by the time the conversation comes up, Half the argument is won because they see Christ in us and they realize we have something that they don't have. I think one of the things I appreciate about that point is just that it shows that the person sees themselves as important and it's not just an argument. Exactly, exactly. Uh, number two, he began with people where they said they were. I think this is always a difficult thing if someone comes up and says, for example, well, I'm a Christian, and you have this sneaking suspicion that maybe not. But if you give the impression that you're doubting their words right from the beginning, it doesn't make for a good relationship. So when the woman at the well, for example, said to the Lord, I don't have a husband, he didn't say, you liar. He said, uh, well, you're right, you don't. I mean, you've had five, and now you're living with a man who isn't. Uh, when the young man said, all these I have kept from my youth up, Jesus could have called out every last sin the man had ever committed in breaking those commandments. But he didn't. He said, oh, by the way, there's one more. And that was the most convicting one. Or in the parable, I knew you were a hard man. Well, the Lord's not a hard man. But he said, well, if I am a hard man, well, then I would think that, you know, so I think in talking to people, if people say, I'm a Christian, to say, well, as a Christian, what would you say are one of the most wonderful things about being a Christian? Now, I'll tell you first, and then you tell me what you think. For me, the most wonderful thing about being a Christian is my sins are gone, and I'm best friends with Jesus, and I can talk to him anytime. I have joy and peace and believing. I know for sure that I'm going to heaven. Isn't it great? Now, when they leave me, if they're not truly saved, they have a clear impression. I don't have what that man has. I, I'm not a Christian like he's a Christian. And so without questioning or calling them liars, without doubting what they say, start where they are or where they think they are and then journey with them from there. I think it's a good tactic and Jesus used it very effectively. And then number three, he distinguished between different types of sinners. I'm afraid sometimes we get into sort of a, uh, a style of evangelism where everything comes down to an equation. And we need to be adaptable in how we present the gospel. 
So, for example, the Lord distinguishes between a 50 pence and a 500 pence sinner. He's saying to this Pharisee, Simon, I'm not saying you're as wicked as this woman is, but I'm simply saying that if you owe a $100,000 mortgage debt or a million dollar mortgage debt and you don't have any money to pay it, you're equally in trouble. And so the Lord Jesus was doing this all the time. When the Pharisees came, they clearly distinguished themselves from the publicans and sinners at the front of the crowd. The Lord Jesus did too. He didn't say that everyone was a prodigal who'd gone to the far country to waste his life and riot his living. There are people that are out working in the field thinking that they're working their way into the Father's heart. The Lord says, you can't do that. You're already in my heart. And so the Lord makes a clear distinction between those two. But he basically says, even though you didn't go to the far country, you're not in the Father's house either. You're in the field. And you need to come in through the same door that the prodigal came through if you're going to enjoy the blessings of the Father's house. So this is important for us. Sometimes we preach and say that all our righteousness is are as filthy rags. That verse was addressed to people who were misbehaving badly during the week and showing up on Saturday at the temple thinking that they were disguising themselves from God. And he says, nobody's fooling me. On the other hand, we hear the words concerning Cornelius, thine alms and prayers have come up before me as memorial. Cornelius wasn't trying to fake anything. He wasn't trying to, uh, to pay off God with his good works. So we need to be careful that we don't prejudge that issue. Good works are not a bad thing. They're just not currency to get you to heaven. So we need to be careful in making the distinctions that Jesus made. Number four, he responded to the split-second timing of God's will. You can see why this is so important. When Philip was told to head down to the Gaza Strip, he intercepted a man who was probably the first missionary to Africa. And I'm happy to tell my African-American friends that God made sure the gospel went to Africa before it even went to Europe. So don't think Christianity is a white man's religion. It began in Asia, then went to Africa, and finally showed up in Europe. We were the latecomers to the gospel. But if Philip hadn't run, he would not have intercepted the eunuch when he was in Isaiah, what we call chapter 53. Now you try and preach the gospel from the beginning of 52 or the end of 54. Maybe you can do it, but it's a lot easier to preach it from 53. So the Lord was always watching out for the Father's directives. And this is important because time is going by. It's not stagnant. And if you don't step in at the right moment, you can miss your opportunity. The Lord prompts you to do something, you better do it, because otherwise you may miss that opportunity. And so he says at the wedding in Cana, mine hour is not yet come. And yet in a split second it had. And the Lord was saying, Mary, I'm not working on your schedule anymore. I'm out of the home. I'm doing my father's ministry. I have begun my public ministry. So you're you're going to have to wait. Likewise, when the two days where he abode in the same place, after Lazarus had become sick, the disciples said, Lord, we got to get up there right away. And the Lord just said, well, no, this is, this is my father's schedule. So be careful that if you're going to be the Lord's servant, you've got to be prompt in responding. And then number five, he asked diagnostic questions. These are classic, of course, right from his earliest days when he's just a boy and he's sitting surrounded by the leaders of the temple and it says that he was both hearing them and asking them questions. And I'm sure some of those questions were doozies. Uh, we have a great example of that in Matthew 22 where they'd been asking him questions all day. And finally he said, excuse me, gentlemen, could I ask you a question? And, of course, they were happy to comply. And he said, what do you think about Messiah? Whose son is he? Well, even the little boys knew the answer to that. 
He's the son of David. Well, he said, now, if he's David's son, why did David call him his Lord? How could David's son be David's Lord? When he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Of course, the only answer is that he's both the root and the offspring of David. That he is the root from which David grew. He pre-existed David and then he sprang from the line of David. It's the only solution. And so by asking the right questions, he elicited in a way that they really were not, they weren't happy to do it. It wasn't voluntary, but the answer clearly sprang to their minds just by him asking that question. So it's a very powerful way to ask good diagnostic questions. Number six, he didn't mind changing the topic. Right. I think this is important that we don't just allow ourselves to be led into answering questions that are to no profit. The Apostle Paul warns about this. There are questions that are not profitable. There are some questions that are only designed to disguise the truth, not to reveal it. And we need to stay away from that. When people bring questions to us that are designed as smoke screens or as red herrings to get us away from the real issue. And so with Nicodemus, Nicodemus says, we know how you do these miracles. And the Lord didn't want to talk about how he did them. He said, if you don't understand how the wind blows, I'm not going to explain to you how the spirit moves. And if you don't understand how a baby's born, I'm not going to explain to you how a person's born again. But I will explain why I'm doing these miracles. The reason I'm doing these miracles is so that they're windows into the kingdom. If I were the king, this is the kind of world it would be. With people healed and broken hearts mended, that's the kind of world it would be. So if you want to see the kingdom, you can look in here and you can see what the kingdom would be like. Now if you want to enter into the kingdom, you'll have to be born from above. You'll need the life of the kingdom to live in that kingdom. So he was quite prepared to shift the topic and say, well, I really would rather not talk about that, but let's talk about this. Then number seven, he provided concrete illustrations for abstract ideas. It's difficult for people to understand not only abstract ideas, but heavenly abstract ideas. And so the Lord Jesus was always looking for common resources that he could use to translate into divine ideas. So in John 6, with the little boy's lunch, people are hungry. They get it. Hunger is a little reminder that I'm not sufficient in myself. I need something outside to meet the need within. And bread, for example, was living. It was grain and then it was cut down and made into flour. But when I eat it, it comes back to life and it becomes my life in me. What a beautiful illustration. So that's exactly what the Lord uses. The Passover is near. So they already had manna on their mind. They were already thinking about the journey of their ancestors. And so the Lord Jesus does that and then eventually says, you need to eat me. Well, they're all shocked by this, but basically he's saying, you understand this principle of hunger and food and how it meets your need. You have a spiritual need, a need that can only be met by heaven. And I'm the bread of God that has come down to satisfy you. And in the same way that you physically receive bread to satisfy your physical need, you will need to receive me spiritually to satisfy the need of your soul. Great illustration. And he was doing this all the time. A man born blind. By the end of the story, uh, the Pharisees are saying, are we blind also? Is that your point? They got it. They understood. He was introducing to them abstract ideas, but he was using physical counterparts that illustrated for them something that was perhaps more difficult to grasp otherwise. Then we have number eight, he sidestepped political and racial issues to keep from being distracted. This goes back to the idea of being an ambassador, that ambassadors don't get involved in local issues. 
They represent another country and they speak for that country. And it's really easy today for us to be distracted and to lose half, if not all, our audience. Because God wants, for example, in America, he wants to save Democrats as much as Republicans. And so I don't want to be identified with something that would actually undermine my ambassadorial standing to reach all the people for the Lord. So when they said to him, uh, should we pay temple tax? That was a political question. The Lord Jesus turned it to a spiritual question. Whose image is on the coin? Oh, Caesar's. Well, then give it to him. But give to God what belongs to God. And likewise, when the, the woman at the well of Samaria, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. We don't talk to each other. What he did was he overrode the particular issue, the issue of their racial background, and he went to the general need of all humanity. You're thirsty, I'm thirsty. Hey, we've got that in common. I was very often asked, uh, what did I think of a certain president? And it was a test question. And uh, so in this case, I could say, well, as far as I know, President Obama has been uh, loyal to his wife and loving to his children. And I think we need that kind of a model. If you're asking me what do I think of his foreign policy or his fiscal policy, I don't even balance my own checkbook. So I, I, I wouldn't want to comment on that. But by doing that, I kept the door open to bring in the gospel. So we're not here to give our opinions. We're here to speak for the Lord. And we need to remember that. And then number nine, he used stories to disarm opposition. I think it's important to realize you can't antagonize and evangelize at the same time. And when a hostile crowd came, and a classic example is of the prodigal, where Jesus had a willing audience of these common people, and when the Pharisees came to the back of the crowd, they were ready to, they had their dukes up. They wanted to fight. And so the Lord Jesus said, let me tell you fellows a story. Well, who can argue with that? Everybody loves a good story. And he begins by talking about a hundred sheep and one's lost. Which of you having a hundred sheep? You see, their objection to Jesus was, they thought that Jesus was wrong in hanging around these sinners. He should be with polite company. And so Jesus tells the story and says, which of you, pointing to the Pharisees, if you had a hundred sheep and you lost one, what would you say? Oh, well, sheep have more sheep. I'll just write it off as a business expense. No, you go after the lost sheep. It makes sense, doesn't it, gentlemen, that if you lose something, you go looking for it. God thinks he's lost something when you went away from him and he sent me to come and find you. So that makes sense, doesn't it? But he goes from one out of a hundred to one out of 10. If a businessman loses 1%, no problem. 10%, he's a little concerned. But in the third story, it's 50%. It's one of two boys. But we don't find out till the end of the story which of the boys is really lost. And by that time, they've had their dukes down because they're hearing the story and thinking, oh, we can apply this. Obviously, these publicans and sinners, they're the, the lost sheep and we're the good little sheep that stayed home. Good. Oh, coins, yeah, that's good. We like coins, and, uh, and uh, obviously we're the good coins. It didn't get lost. But by the third story now, they're disarmed. And the Lord Jesus, just at the end of the story, says, By the way, gentlemen, would you be interested in the other brother and what happened with him? That's powerful. And so using a good story can disarm the opposition and can get the truth in quietly, gently, simply, and there's no objection. It's a fiction story. You can't say that never happened. You knew it didn't happen when I started telling the story. And so it's a wonderful way to disarm the opposition and to slip in the message before they hardly notice it's arrived. And then finally, number 10, he took advantage of current events to add the eternal perspective. Again, this is a fine line here, not getting involved in politics, but at the same time using current events that's on everybody's mind. If in the marketplace everybody's talking about something, use it as a springboard to the gospel. Don't use it to expostulate on your position, but use it as a link 
to take people to the gospel. So you have examples. There are two current events at the beginning of Luke 13, where Pilate had killed some of the people in the temple and where the Tower of Siloam had collapsed on some people. And so the Lord Jesus uses those stories that are clearly on the front page news and he takes them to the next step and says, wait a minute, do you think those people were more wicked than you? That's how sometimes people think. You know, it didn't happen to me. I must be a good guy. I must be on God's good list. But he said, no, I tell you, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. You're all in the same boat. I love that in John 7, 37, where uh, on the eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles, on that day, the high priest went down to the Pool of Siloam, the lowest place in Jerusalem, and he brought this gold vessel with water up to the temple site where they were offering the sacrifice and the crowds were there and they had their palm fronds and they're waving their palm fronds and they're singing the words of Isaiah chapter 12 and verse 3 which says, Therefore with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And they're thinking about that occasion where God brought water out of the rock for them in the desert. And all of a sudden, there's a voice that shouts. Jesus rarely raised his voice, but on this occasion, he cried with a loud voice, and you can be sure every person in that audience heard him. Is anybody thirsty? Let him come to me and drink. That's the kind of preaching we need today. <laughs> People who speak to present need and link present events and point people to the cross, point people to eternity. And Jesus was the master at it. If we're going to be effective, we've got to master the tactics of Jesus, the doctrine of Paul, and the language of John. And if we can do that, we will be effective presenting the gospel to the present generation. God help us to do that.